And in this chapter, there is a solution. We're going to talk about two powers. We're going to talk about the power of the fellowship, and we're going to talk about the power of the vital spiritual experience. And if we who are powerless could get both of these powers in our lives, then maybe we could overcome alcoholism also. On page 17, for those who are powerless, he writes the prescription. Here he talks about the two powers. Abby presented Bill with a solution, and now Bill's going to present us with a solution in the same way. He said, there is a solution. And as a friend of mine back home says, there's many different types of solutions as there are people in AA. And I say, if you look at the chapter heading on page 17, it'll tell you how many solutions there are. There is a solution, one. He said, we, and there's that big word again. We of Alcoholics Anonymous know thousands of men and women who were just as hopeless as Bill. Nearly all have recovered. They have solved the drink problem. He said, we're average Americans. Today we can say that we're average citizens of the world because of my last count there was a AAs in 154 countries around the world. So all sections of this country and many occupations are represented, as well as many political, economic, social, and religious backgrounds. We are people who normally would not mix. And I think that we're probably the most mixed up group of alcoholics in the world here this morning, <laughs> here in Laughlin, Nevada. You know, if we didn't have alcoholics to talk, alcoholics anonymous to talk about, or drinking and recovery therefrom, I wonder what we would drink about, talk about. There's hardly anything. <laughs> <laughs> Told you I had a good memory; it's just short. <laughs> we wouldn't, we wouldn't have anything to talk about. But we're, it says that we are people who normally would not mix. But there exists among us a fellowship and a friendliness which is indescribably wonderful. And I hear that this morning and before the meeting. All the talk and the laughter and the going on, that's the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, the spirit of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got sober on the spirit of Alcoholics Anonymous. That was the only thing keeping me here. So it's a powerful thing. The fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous kept me sober for quite some time. Now he's going to describe this fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. By talking about something, he already assumes that we know about it, or he knows, thinks we already know about it. And all great teachers have always done this. When they wanted to teach you something new, they would talk to you first about something you already know and use that as an example to teach you something new. You know, we had a great teacher that lived 2,000 years ago, and he was really good at this. When he wanted to teach something to a shepherd, he, told, he would tell him a story about sheep. But if he wanted to teach the same thing to the fisherman, he would change his story. This time it would be about fish. Then when he went to the farmer, he talked about cattle and grains. All good teachers do this. Bill is going to use the example of the great passenger ship. He said, we are like the passengers of a great liner. The moment after rescue from shipwreck, when camaraderie, joyousness, and democracy pervade the vessel from steerage to captain's table. You know, Bill is referring to a time in the 30s. When your mode of transportation from one continent to another was by the great ocean liners. And on those great ocean liners, they had what they called the steerage section. And people who were immigrants that didn't have very much money, they usually booked passage in the steerage section. Way down in the bowels of the ship, very little fresh air, dormitory style living. I called it the cheese sandwich section. Not very good down there. Now, if you had a little more money, though, and you wanted better accommodations, you could pay for fourth class and come up a deck or two. Then you could go third class and come up another deck or two. Then you could go second class and come up another deck or two, and each time the accommodations and the food were better. If you had enough money, you could go in what they call first class. In first class, they had big, fine state rooms. They had great dining rooms. They had good food, fine waiters, access to fresh air all the time. But that still wasn't the most elite place on the ship. If you had the right kind of money... Old, old money. Old money. <laughs> if you had the right religion, the right ethnic background, the right everything, you might be invited to dine at the captain's table. Just a few select people could do that. And at the captain's table, you had the best of everything the best service, the best food, the best everything. Now, it's a long, long ways from the captain's table to the steerage section. And in the journey across the ocean, those two people should never have met each other. In fact, most of those ocean liners even had separate stairwells. So the first-class people never even had to see 
those who rode in the steerage section. They had nothing whatsoever in common. Then I think about the Titanic and the night it hit the iceberg. And these two guys are standing there at the rail of the ship. And one of them got his tuxedo on, his shiny shoes and his little bow tie and everything that goes with it. Standing next to him is the guy from the steerage section. Got his old work overalls on, his old brogans, never wore a tie in his life. These guys had nothing whatsoever in common with each other until they jumped overboard. And when they jumped overboard and their butts hit that cold water, they had something in common. How in the hell do we save ourselves? And they grabbed on to each other and held on to each other. And I doubt very seriously if the man from the captain's table asked for a financial statement from the man from the steerage section. And when these two guys were rescued and got back on another ship or back on land, there was a feeling amongst them which was indescribably wonderful. This has always been true. When people escape from a common peril, there is a feeling that ties them together, and it's one of the greatest feelings in the world, and that's what we got in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. We don't care who you are. We don't care where you came from. We don't care how much money you got. We don't care what your education is. We don't care what your ethnic background is, what your religion is, or anything else. All we want to know is, are you an alcoholic? And if you are... There is a feeling amongst us which is indescribably wonderful. Even though we are so different from each other, we are still bound together. Now watch him. He's going to give us a warning. Unlike the feeling of the ship's passengers, however, our joy in escape from disaster does not subside as we go our individual ways. These two guys, when they finally got back on shore, they looked at each other. They said, well, we really don't belong together. And they separated, probably never to meet again. But we will always be alcoholic. And this feeling we have for each other never goes away. And we find it again in city after city after city and country after country. One of the greatest things I've been able to experience in my lifetime is to go to an AA meeting in a foreign country and feel just exactly as good as I did at home. Even though I don't know those people, we are bound together because we're alcoholics. The feeling of having shared in a common peril is one element of the powerful semen which binds us. But that in itself would never have held us together as we are now joined. In other words, this feeling we have for each other in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is one of the things that bind us together. But then he said that itself is not enough. The tremendous fact for every one of us is that we have discovered a common solution. We have a way out on which we can absolutely agree and upon which we can join in brotherly and harmonious action. This is the great news this book carries to those who suffer from alcoholism. Not the news of the fellowship, but the news of the common solution. And later on we're going to see where the common solution is the spiritual experience brought about through the program of action. Now if we could get the power of the fellowship which supports us and helps us And if we could get the power of the spiritual experience which changes us and add the two together, then that will be enough power to overcome our powerlessness over alcohol and we can recover from that condition. I think one of the greatest tragedies that I see in the world today, and there's lots of tragedies going on in the world today, one of the greatest that I see is we people who are in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous are spending literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of men and women work hours, trying to attract other alcoholics to the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, when we've got thousands and thousands who are already members of Alcoholics Anonymous who are sitting around dying from untreated alcoholism because they're doing nothing about the common solution. And the reason they're doing nothing about the common solution is nobody's telling them about it. Nobody's talking about it. Nobody's saying, look, here's the program of action. Nobody's saying, let me take you by the hand and walk with you so you can have a spiritual experience. And they're fellowship only, and after a while they go back to drinking. And they said, well, AA don't work for us. No, they didn't work for AA. They didn't do the program. And again, it's not their fault. It's our fault. Because we're not insisting that new people work the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and we're letting them die around us. Thousands of us are dying every day who are already members of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I think it's our responsibility to see that every newcomer knows about page 17 and knows there's two powers, the power of the fellowship 
and the power of the spiritual experience. And we're not going to recover without both of them. Now, we might stay sober for a while, but we're not going to recover from alcoholism without both of them. No more preaching today. (laughs) Guarantee you that. Preached a little last night. Preached just a little bit this morning. We'll try not to preach anymore. (laughs) A good textbook never tells you anything, but what it doesn't back it up and prove it. The first half of this chapter is designed to show you and I why fellowship alone is not sufficient. The last half of this chapter is used to show us the solution to alcoholism, the vital spiritual experience. Let's look for just a few minutes at why fellowship alone is not sufficient, and then we'll take a break. Let's go to page 20. He said, you may already have asked yourself why it is so all of us became so very ill from drinking. Doubtless you are curious to discover how and why, in the face of expert opinion to the contrary, we have recovered from a hopeless condition of mind and body. Now, if you're an alcoholic who wants to get over it, you may already be asking, well, what do I have to do? It's the purpose of this book to answer such questions specifically. Remember last night we talked about precisely, specifically, with clear-cut directions. Well, here's one of those words. We shall tell you what we've done. Before going into detailed discussion, it may be well to summarize some points as we see them. Now, how many times people have said to us, I can take it or leave it alone. Why can't he? Why don't you drink like a gentleman and quit? That fellow can't handle his liquor. Why don't you try a beer and wine and lay off the hard stuff? His willpower must be weak. He could stop if he wanted to. She's such a sweet girl. I should think he'd stop for her sake. The doctor told him that if he ever drank again, it would kill him. But there he is, all it up again. Now, these are commonplace observations on drinkers which we hear all the time. Back of them is a world of ignorance and misunderstanding. We see that these expressions refer to people whose reactions are very different from ours. Now, we're going to look at two kinds of drinkers that these expressions that Joe just read would refer to them. So modern drinkers have little trouble in giving up liquor entirely if they have good reason for it. They can take it or leave it alone. Remember we talked about them last night? They have a couple of drinks. They get a slightly tipsy, out-of-control beginnings of a nauseous feeling. Alcohol is no big deal for them. If they have any problems with it, they simply leave it alone. Those expressions that Joe read would certainly refer to the moderate drinker. Then we have a certain type of hard drinker. He may have the habit badly enough to gradually impair him physically and mentally, and it may even cause him to die a few years before his time. Now, if a sufficiently strong reason, ill health, falling in love, change of environment, or the warnings of a doctor becomes operative, if they do, this man can stop all or moderate, although he may find it difficult and troublesome and may even need a little medical attention. Now, we call this guy the heavy or the hard drinker. They drink like we alcoholics drink. But they are not alcoholic. If a good enough reason presents itself to them, they'll do one or two things. They may learn to moderate their drinking. They do not have the physical allergy. They may quit drinking entirely and stay quit. They do not have the obsession of the mind. They drink like us, but they're not alcoholic. And you and I see them all the time. They're the guy that said, when I was in the service, I was an alcoholic also. But when I got out of the service, I got married, went to church, quit drinking. Don't see why in the hell you can't. No, they're not alcoholic. The expressions that Joe read in the beginning would refer to the heavy drinker. But what about the real alcoholic? Now, he may start off as a moderate drinker, which many of us did. He may or may not become a continuous hard drinker. Some of us stayed periodic. But at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. Now then, we're going to describe the real alcoholic. And when you see a description in there that fits you, would you please raise your hand? We'd like to see if we're in a room full of real alcoholics. He said, but at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. Mm -hmm. Charlie talked last night about... (laughs) He talked last night about crossing over that line. He talked last night about crossing over that line, but I don't know what line he was talking about, but I know one thing, I was drunk when I went over it. <laughs> okay, now here's the fellow who's been puzzling you, especially in his lack of control. He does absurd, incredible, tragic things while drinking. He's a real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He's seldom mildly intoxicated. He's always more or less insanely drunk. Anybody like that in here? Yeah. You betcha. His disposition while drinking resembles his normal nature, but little. I always get good looking and out of debt as soon as I start drinking. 
He may be one of the finest fellows in the world. You let him drink for a day, and he frequently becomes disgustingly and even dangerously antisocial. Have got any of those people in here? He has a positive genius for getting tied at exactly the wrong moment, particularly when some important decision must be made or engagement. Anybody kept. like that in here always getting drunk at the wrong time? Now, everybody holds their hand up on this one. He's often perfectly sensible and well-balanced concerning everything except liquor, <laughs> but in that respect, he's incredibly dishonest and selfish. He often speci- possesses special ability, skills, and aptitudes and has a promising career ahead of him. Anybody like that in here? I've never heard anybody but an alcoholic say that, though. I, I've never heard an al say it yet. He used his gifts to build up a bright outlook for his family and himself. Then he pulls the structure down on his head by a senseless series serious disbreeze. Anybody like that in here? He's, yeah. a, he's the fellow who goes t- to bed so intoxicated he ought to sleep the clock around. Yet early the next morning, he searches madly for the bottle he misplaced the night before. Any bottle hiders in here? Yeah. If he can afford it, he may have liquor concealed all over his house to be certain no one gets his entire supply away from him to throw down the waste pipe. Anybody spread him around wherever you might be? Phyllis and I used to buy a lug of whiskey, which is three-fifths, and one to share and one to hide from each other. (laughs) As matters grow worse, he begins to use a combination of high-powered sedative and liquor to quiet his nerves so he can go to work. Anybody ever have to have a little something in the morning? Then comes a day when he simply cannot make it and gets drunk all over again. Perhaps he goes to a doctor who gives him morphine or some sedative to wish to taper off. Then he begins to appear at hospitals and treatments, or excuse me, sanitariums. Yeah. Never did taper off. I always tapered on for some reason. I don't know. Uh, this is by no means a comprehensive picture of the true alcoholic as her behavior patterns vary, but this description should identify him roughly. You know, if our government has ever done anything right in the field of alcoholism, It's an education of the public as to what alcoholism is and what it isn't. Because of that, a lot of the stigma has been removed from alcoholism. Many, many people are getting to us today before they have to do everything here that describes the real alcoholic. But I'll guarantee you, if you're a real alcoholic, you found yourself in there somewhere. At least one of them are going to fit you. In my case, practically every one of them. One in particular. Seven years after I got sober... I sold a 40-acre, 45,000 broiler chicken operation. For years after that, every once in a while I would run into the guy that bought it, and sometimes he would wave and smile and say, Hey, Charlie, we have found another one. And he's referring to partially empty vodka bottles. Behind corner posts, under rocks, hollow trees, fallen out of feed bins. Hell, he found them for years in there. (laughs) Now, here's the question. Why does he behave like this? If hundreds of experiences have shown him that one drink means another debacle with all his attendant suffering and humiliation, why is it that he takes that one drink? Why can't he stay on the water wagon? The moderate drinker can. The heavy drinker can. Why can't the alcoholic? What has become of the common sense and willpower that he still sometimes displays with respect to other matters? Perhaps there never will be a full answer to these questions. Opinions vary considerably as to why the alcoholic reacts differently from normal people. We're not sure why once a certain point is reached, little can be done for him. We cannot answer the riddle. We know that while the alcoholic keeps away from drink, as he may do for months or years, he reacts much like other men. We are equally positive. That once he takes any alcohol, whatever, into his system, something happens both in a bodily and mental sense which makes it virtually impossible for him to stop. The experience of any alcoholic will abundantly confirm this. Now, these observations would be academic and pointless if our friend never took the first drink, thereby setting the terrible cycle in motion. Therefore, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. Would you read that again, please? Therefore, the main problem the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. Now, we must remember that always, just before we take the first drink, we are stone cold sober. Or stark raving sober. Or stark raving sober, one of the two. (laughs) And the real problem centers in our mind telling us we can drink while sober, rather than in the body that ensures that we can't drink. Chances are you'll never go put your hand on a hot stove again to see if it'll burn you the second time. You know, I remember as a kid growing up back in the Depression years, and there's 
There's a few of you in here old enough to remember that too. And back in the 1930s, we didn't have very much. We didn't have hot and cold running water. We didn't have forced air heat. Joe said his family was not so poor they had to live in a tent, but he said, by God, if we'd had the money, we'd have lived in a tent. That's about how bad it was. (laughs) But I remember in those days, even though you didn't have anything, you were very poor people. Cleanliness was still next to godliness. And every Saturday night, everybody in the family had to take a bath. Now, whether you needed a bath or not is beside the point. You still had to take one. And one night in the middle of the winter... Mother had heated the bath water on the old heating stove in the living room, put it in a number three zinc wash tub sitting behind that stove. Now every kid in the family takes a bath in the same water. I'm the baby of the family. (laughs) By the time it got to me, the crud would be about an inch thick on it. Mother said, get in there and get yourself clean. I thought to myself, how in the hell did I get clean there? But I didn't dare say that to her. You didn't talk to your parents that way in the 1930s. I scraped the crud back. I got in the tub, began to wash myself, heating stove standing here red hot. Somehow I managed to lean over and stick my rear against that hot stove. <laughs> Burned a blister on my rear end about as big as my hand. Hurt me worse than anything had ever hurt me before. And do you know I've never had an obsession of mine to stick my ass on a hot stove <laughs> since then? <laughs> I have never jerked my britches down, backed up to a stove, and said, burn me again. (laughs) Now, alcohol has burned me over and over and over and over and over, just as bad as that stove ever burned me, and for some strange reason, my mind cannot remember that. Left on my own resources, I start thinking about drinking, and after a while, I think about only what it's going to do for me. That great sense of ease and comfort. That great exciting in control feeling that comes from the first couple of drinks. And my mind keys in on that. I forget about the jailhouse, the hospitals and the divorce courts. And I don't see a thing in the world wrong with taking a drink. And I take a drink and I trigger the allergy and I end up drunk over and over and over again. Last paragraph, page 24. So now when this sort of thinking is fully established in an individual with alcoholic tendencies, he has probably placed himself beyond human aid. And unless locked up, may die, go permanently insane. Now if we've placed ourselves beyond human aid, then the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous will not bring about recovery because the fellowship is made up of a group of human beings who are just as powerless over alcohol as I am. So there's got to be a solution to that condition that we've just talked about. And page 25 gives it to us. There is a solution. Let's go to page 25. Let's begin to look at the solution. We could see that the uh, fellowship gave us enough power to support us for a while. But we were told that fellowship alone is not sufficient. And then it explained why fellowship alone is not sufficient. So now on page 25, we'll start looking at the real solution to alcoholism. He said there is a solution. And almost none of us like the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, the confession of shortcomings which the process requires for a successful consummation. But we saw that it really worked in others and had to come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life that we've been living it. When therefore we were approached by whom the problem had been solved, there was nothing left for us but to pick up a simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet. And we have found much of heaven and have been rocketed into a fourth dimension of, of existence of which we had not even dreamed. The great fact is just this and nothing less, that we've had deep and effective spiritual experiences, which have revolutionized our whole attitude toward life, toward our fellows, and toward God's universe. The central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. He has commenced to accomplish those things for us which we could never do by ourselves. And you notice up there it says the great fact is just this and nothing less, that we've had deep and effective spiritual experiences. And there's a little asterisk there referring us down to the bottom of the page. It said fully explained on Appendix 2. And later on we'll refer to it on page 27. It says for further amplification, see Appendix 2. And on page 47, referring to the asterisk, it says, please see Appendix 2. <laughs> they want to make... Yeah, Must they, be important. Very important. They repeat it three times. 
And they're talking about spiritual experiences and spiritual awakenings. And in the first printing of the book, they didn't have this little asterisk in the, there, and it didn't have the reference to the spiritual experience in the back of the book. And a lot of people would write into that little office to Bill and say, Bill, what do you mean by spiritual experiences and spiritual awakenings? We're, not, we're doing the same things that you're doing, but we're not having the same experiences that you have. What do you mean by that? And, you know, and it was very important for me, looking back at it now that I know this, because I had this spiritual experience mixed up with a bunch of things that I learned when I was seven or eight years old. Because when I was seven or eight years old, I told myself, I said, Self, <laughs> if I ever get big enough they can't catch me, I'm not going anymore. To church, that is. And I got big enough they couldn't catch me, and I didn't go. So when I arrived at Alcoholics Anonymous, I had the spiritual knowledge of a seven or eight-year-old boy, which was practically none. And that that I did have was all mistaken and mixed, and mixed up in lots of emotionalism, things I didn't understand. The times that they would catch me, take me to that revival. They had a revival there quite often in my area, in the Southern Baptist, Southern Baptist, really Southern. <laughs> and uh, when I would get there and, and they would be preaching all day and singing songs and having dinner on the ground and prayer meetings all day long and church way into the night, bored the heck out of me. But one night my Aunt Much, and she's a big woman, Aunt Much, that's, that's the reason they called her that, but Aunt Much kind of got in the spirit of this thing that night, and she began to jump up and down, and she began to talk in a strange language that I'd never heard of before, squealing and hollering, lo- rolling around in the sawdust, scared the heck out of me. So when this book began to talk about spiritual experiences and spiritual awakenings, I thought that was what I was going to have to have. And I was dreading it, I tell you I was. But thank God for people like me who didn't know any better. They put this information in the back of the book talking about spiritual experiences and spiritual awakenings. And this is, these is used all throughout this book. And they want to make real sure that I understand what they mean by that. So let's go back to page 569 and see what they mean by the term spiritual awakening and spiritual experiences. So on page 569. The term spiritual experience and spiritual awakening are used many times in this book, which upon careful reading... We all know that alcoholics don't do careful reading. <laughs> Shows that the personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism has manifested itself among us in many different forms. Okay, the first paragraph, we see something. We see that the term may be spiritual experience or it may be spiritual awakening. And in either case, it's going to be a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery. Dr. Silkworth referred to this as a psychic change. A change in the way we think and the way we feel and our attitude. So we could see several terms. Spiritual experience, spiritual awakening, personality change, or psychic change. All meaning the same thing. Spiritual experience happens suddenly, like it did with Bill and some of the people in the back of the stories in the first book. And then we have a spiritual awakening which develops slowly over a period of a long time. Said so yet it is true that our first printing gave many readers the impressions that these personality changes or religious experiences must be in the nature of sudden and spectacular upheavals. Well, happily for everyone, this conclusion is erroneous. In the first few chapters, a number of sudden revolutionary changes are described, though it was not our intention to create such an impression. Many alcoholics have nevertheless concluded that in order to recover, they must acquire an immediate and overwhelming God consciousness, followed at once by a vast change in feeling and outlook. Among our rapidly growing membership of thousands of alcoholics, such transformations, though frequent, are by no means the rule. Most of our experiences are what the psychologist William James calls the educational variety because they will develop slowly over a period of time. Now, Bill's was a sudden, spectacular change. Some of the others in the stories in the back of the book were sudden, spectacular changes. But what he's saying here is that most of us, it won't happen that way. Most of us will have the educational variety, and we will change as we learn and as we apply slowly over a period of time. Sooner or later, though, we awaken to the fact that we have changed also, and then we'll call it a spiritual awakening. So it really doesn't make any difference whether it's sudden and spectacular or whether it's a slow thing that involves over a period of time. In either case, it's going to be a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery. Now, I can begin to think with this. I can live with this kind of idea. But when you start talking about what Aunt Much had in the Baptist church, 
I couldn't live with that idea at all because I was raised in the Southern Baptist Church too. And my idea of a spiritual experience was an entirely different thing. Thank God for this appendix that let me know what it really is, a change in my personality. My personality is made up by the way I think, by the way I feel, my attitude and outlook upon life, people, places, and things in general. That's what determines my personality. I come here restless, irritable, and discontented, filled with shame, fear, guilt, and remorse. If I can change from that to peace of mind, serenity, and happiness, I've undergone one hell of a change in my personality. It's the educational variety, the type that we're having this weekend, right? We won't be the same after this weekend. None of us will. None of us will. No. See, quite often friends of the newcomer are aware of the difference long before he is himself. He finally realizes that he has undergone a profound alteration in his reaction to life, that such a change could hardly have been brought about by himself alone. What often takes place in a few months could seldom have been accomplished by years of self-discipline. With few exceptions, our members find that they have tapped an unsuspected inner resource, which they presently identify with their own conception of a power greater than themselves. Most of us think this awareness of a power greater than ourselves is the essence of spiritual experience. Our more religious members call it God consciousness. But most emphatically, we wish to say that any alcoholic capable of honestly facing his problems in the light of our experience can recover, provided he does not close his mind to all spiritual concepts. He can only be defeated by an attitude of intolerance or belligerent denial. We find that no one need have difficulty with the spirituality of the program. Willingness, honesty, and open-mindedness are the essentials of recovery but they are indispensable. There is a principle which is bar against all information, which is proof against all argument, and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. And that principle is contempt prior to investigation. See, I knew so many things that were not true when I arrived in Alcoholics Anonymous. Lifelong theories that were not true. I lived my life based upon those things, and they didn't work. And they were so true in my mind that it was almost impossible for me to learn something that was true. So I've had to lay, a lie, lay aside a bunch of old ideas to be able to accept new, and I needed an open mind. In fact, I need an open mind more today than I've ever needed an open mind because there's so much more to learn throughout life. Okay, now we pointed out the fact a while ago that Bill loves to teach by using examples of something we already know about to teach us something new. That's what he did when he used the great ocean liner. Another trend that Bill has, and I think it's very important for us to realize it, is like most writers, he did repeat himself quite often. But every time he repeated himself, he would normally find a different word that means the same thing. And if you see what he's doing, you can understand him. If you don't, though, you'll think he's talking about something different. There seems to be one key word in this whole thing dealing with spiritual experience, and that is the word change. Let's see how many times he said change on page 569 and how many different ways he had to say in it. In the first paragraph, he talked about a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery. In the second paragraph, he again mentioned personality changes. But then he said, in the nature of sudden and spectacular upheavals, An upheaval is to change something entirely. In the third paragraph, first sentence, he said sudden revolutionary changes. To revolutionize something is to change it entirely. Third paragraph, last sentence, he said immediate and overwhelming God consciousness. To overwhelm something is to change it entirely. Third paragraph, last sentence, he said vast change in feeling and outlook. Fourth paragraph, first sentence, he said such transformations. To transform is to change. Fourth paragraph, about the middle of it, he said profound alteration. To alter is to change. So the key thing here is to change from what we were when we came here to something entirely different up here in our minds. To go from restless, irritable, discontented, selfish, self-centered human beings to go from that to one who has peace of mind, serenity, and happiness, and the willingness to help others is an entire change in the way we think. That's a spiritual experience. That's a spiritual awakening. That's a personality change sufficient to recover from alcoholism. That's a psychic change. Now, I can buy into that. To go from what we were 
to something entirely different in the way we think. Religion has nothing to do with this at all. We make the change through spirituality. It seems that's the only real way that people change is through spirituality. They talked about change, and I told you when I got here, I had become everything I detested in a human being, and I didn't like who I, what I had become or who I was. So they talked about change, and I thought they meant for me to become something that I'm not. So I looked around the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I found me some heroes, some people that I wanted to be like, and we need those heroes in the beginning. I still need my heroes. Charlie was one of my heroes. So I set about to be exactly like Charlie. I didn't like me, so I wanted to be like Charlie. And I almost made it. Thank God I didn't. (laughs) One don't need one, Charlie. But I tried to emulate and be exactly like him because I didn't like me. And that's good. That's good. I needed that. So the type of change I I think they're talking about today is to change from what I had become to that which God intended for me to be. Just me. Me. And that's a marvelous experience in Alcoholics Anonymous and in life, just to become who you are and what God intended for you to be only. And there's only one of those. Thank God. Now let's go back to page 25. He said, if you're as seriously alcoholic as we were, we believe there's no middle-of-the-road solution. We were in a position where life was becoming impossible, and we had passed into the region which there's no return through human aid. We had but two alternatives. One was to go into the bitter end, blotting out the conscience of our intolerable situation as best we could. That's step one, remaining powerless. And the other, to accept spiritual help. That's step two, to accept the need for the power greater than we are. So this we did because we were honestly wanted to and were willing to make the effort. Now we saw where step one, the physical allergy, the obsession of the mind, we saw where that came from from Dr. Silkworth in New York City. Now, you would think that the idea of the spiritual experience would have come to us through religious people. Let's look on page 26, and let's see where this idea really did come from. Now, we're talking here about a certain American businessman. This is this fellow named Roland Hazard. He was the one that stepped in between Ebby and the judge. Said a certain American businessman had ability, good sense, and high character. For years he had floundered from one sanitarium to another. He had consulted the best known American psychiatrist. Then he had gone to Europe, placing himself in the care of a celebrated physician, the psychiatrist Dr. Jung, who prescribed for him. Though experience had made him skeptical, he finished his treatment with unusual confidence. He didn't go there for a 28 day treatment program. He was with Dr. Jung for a full year. Dr. Jung psychoanalyzed him one day a week for 52 weeks. His physical and mental condition were unusually good. Above all, he believed he had acquired such a profound knowledge of the inner workings of his mind and its hidden springs that relapse was unthinkable. Nevertheless, he was drunk in a short time. More baffling still, he could give himself no satisfactory explanation for his fall. So he returned to this doctor whom he admired, asked him point blank why he could not recover. He wished above all things to regain self-control. He seemed quite rational and well-balanced with respect to other problems, yet he had no control whatever over alcohol. Why was this? He begged the doctor to tell him the whole truth, and he got it. In the doctor's judgment, he was utterly hopeless. He could never regain his position in society. And he would have to place himself under lock and key or hire a bodyguard if he expected to live long. That was a great physician's opinion. But this man still lives and is a free man. He does not need a bodyguard, nor is he confined. He can go anywhere on this earth where the other free men may go without disaster, provided he remains willing to maintain a certain simple attitude. Now, some of our alcoholic readers may think they can do without spiritual help. Let us tell you the rest of our conversation our friend had with his doctor. The doctor said, you have the mind of a chronic alcoholic. I've never seen one single case recover where that state of mind existed to the extent that it does on you. Our friend felt as though the gates of hell had closed on him with a clang. He said to the doctor, is there no exception? Yes, replied the doctor, there is. Exceptions to cases such as yours have been occurring since early times. Here and there, once in a while, alcoholics have had what are called vital spiritual experiences. 
To me, these occurrences are phenomenal. They appear to be in the nature of huge emotional displacements and rearrangements. Change. Ideas, emotions, and attitudes where once the guiding forces of the lives of these men are suddenly cast to one side. Change. And a completely new set of conceptions and motives begin to dominate them. Change. In fact, I've been trying to produce some such emotional rearrangement within you. Change. With many individuals, the methods which are employed are successful, but I've never been successful with an alcoholic of your description. Asterisk, bottom of the page, for amplification, see Appendix 2. <laughs> Can you imagine this? This is the world's third most well-known psychiatrist at that time. It was Dr. Freud, Dr. Adler, and Dr. Jung. Roland goes to Dr. Jung and is treated for a year. Goes out and gets drunk and comes back. Begs the doctor to tell him the whole truth. And this doctor had enough humility to say, Roland, I've done all I can do for you. With my knowledge of the mind and my skills, I just can't help you anymore. You're probably going to die from alcoholism. You know, he could have said, Roland, I think you're suffering from a bad Valium deficiency. <laughs> Let me write you a prescription. You come back for another year. He was a good enough man not to do that. And Roland said, are there no exceptions to this? And this guy was great enough to go out of his field and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Once in a while, I've seen people like you have a vital spiritual experience. He said, I don't understand it. It's phenomenal to me, but I have seen it happen. Now, they tell us that Roland tried to get to Freud first, and Freud wasn't taking any more patience. He tried to get to Adler, and Adler was too busy. Jung was the third choice. Now, Adler and Jung were both students of Freud, and Jung had fallen out with Adler and Jung on one thing only. Adler and Jung thought all answers would lie within the mind. I mean, Adler and Freud. Jung thought some people might be able to be helped through spirituality. You know, thank God that Roland didn't get to Freud or Adler. We'd be sitting around today psychoanalyzing ourselves <laughs> rather than depending upon spirituality. And unfortunately, that's what we're doing in a lot of our AA meetings, trying to psychoanalyze rather than depend upon spirituality. And what blows my mind to think is this. We alcoholics who are so proud of our 12 steps, and rightfully we should be, I think we need to stop once in a while and remember where they came from. Step one came from a non-alcoholic neurologist in New York City named Dr. Silkworth. Step two came from a non-alcoholic psychiatrist on the other side of the world named Dr. Jung. The last ten steps came from a group of people called the Oxford Groupers who were non-alcoholic practicing first century Christianity to the best of their ability. Everything that you and I use for recovery came to us from non-alcoholics. I think we need to remember that. It might be good for our humility to do so, Joe. Is that odd or is that God? <laughs> You know, I think I think about Dr. Silkworth. He he knew what the problem was. He observed that through working with fifty thousand of us alcoholics, and it became his opinion. But he didn't have a solution for it. Dr. Jung had a solution for alcoholism, the vital spiritual experience, but he didn't know what the problem was. The Oxford Group had a, some tenants that we could work. They had the plan, program of action, so to speak, but they weren't in pro involved in the problem or the solution either one. Begs the doctor to tell him the whole truth. And this doctor had enough humility to say, Roland, I've done all I can do for you. With my knowledge of the mind and my skills, I just can't help you anymore. You're probably going to die from alcoholism. You know, he could have said, Roland, I think you're suffering from a bad Valium deficiency. <laughs> Let me write you a prescription. You come back for another year. He was a good enough man not to do that. And Roland said, are there no exceptions to this? And this guy was great enough to go out of his field and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Once in a while, I've seen people like you have a vital spiritual experience. He said, I don't understand it. It's phenomenal to me, but I have seen it happen. 
Now they tell us that Roland tried to get to Freud first. And Freud wasn't taking any more patience. He tried to get to Adler, and Adler was too busy. Jung was the third choice. Now, Adler and Jung were both students of Freud, and Jung had fallen out with Adler and Jung on one thing only. Adler and Jung thought all answers would lie within the mind. I mean, Adler and Freud. Jung thought some people might be able to be helped through spirituality. Now, thank God that Roland didn't get to Freud or Adler. We'd be sitting around today psychoanalyzing ourselves <laughs> rather than depending upon spirituality. And unfortunately, that's what we're doing in a lot of our AA meetings, trying to psychoanalyze rather than depend upon spirituality. And what blows my mind to think is this. We alcoholics who are so proud of our 12 steps, and rightfully we should be, I think we need to stop once in a while and remember where they came from. Step one came from a non-alcoholic neurologist in New York City named Dr. Silkworth. Step two came from a non-alcoholic psychiatrist on the other side of the world named Dr. Jung. The last ten steps came from a group of people called the Oxford Groupers who were non-alcoholic practicing first century Christianity to the best of their ability. Everything that you and I use for recovery came to us from non-alcoholics. I think we need to remember that. It might be good for our humility to do so, Joe. Is that odd or is that God? <laughs> You know, I think I think about Dr. Silkworth. He he knew what the problem was. He observed that through working with fifty thousand of us alcoholics, and it became his opinion. But he didn't have a solution for it. Dr. Jung had a solution for alcoholism, the vital spiritual experience, but he didn't know what the problem was. The Oxford Group had a, some tenants that we could work. They had the plan, program of action, so to speak, but they weren't in pro- involved in the problem or the solution either one. And here's a wholesale miracle that's happened from that moment until this, if you will. He said, but, you know, prior to this, he said, the exceptions to your case has been occurring since early time. Here and there, just once in a while, alcoholics have had what are called vital spiritual experiences. To me, these are a phenomenon. He went back and joined the Oxford Group and, planned, and took the plan program of action of the tenants of the Oxford Group, and he recovered. And he was able to help Ebby, and Ebby brought this to Bill. And Bill was over there getting all this other information jailed in the mind of Bill Wilson, one person. But the miracle is this. Back in those days, it was just here and there, once in a great while. Today, we can look around these rooms at each other and say to each other, here and now, Every time an alcoholic will apply these things to their life, they too can recover. And they call it Alcoholics Anonymous. A wholesale miracle has happened. I am not the miracle. The miracle is Alcoholics Anonymous, and I get to participate in it. I can almost see Bill now as he finishes up with Chapter 2, probably sitting down and reviewing what he's told us up to this point, saying to himself that in the doctor's opinion in my story, I was able to show them the problem. In chapter 2, I was able to show them the solution. Now let's look at a little picture for just a moment illustrating the solution before we go any further. Joe, where is it? Oh, it's up there. It's up there. And that little picture we have up here on the screen, we've talking about what is the solution. And on the left-hand side of the picture, we see the fellowship which supports us, where the older members, through the sharing of their experience, strength, and hope with the newcomer, provides enough support for the newcomer to be able to stay sober for a period of time. And by the way, it's a two-way street. As we older members support the new member, then we draw strength from that too. Great strength in the fellowship. It'd be almost impossible to be in AA today for very long and not begin to believe there's some power greater than human power working within this thing. When you hear countless hundreds of people saying it's only by the grace of God or because of God as I understand it or because of the power greater than I am, I haven't found it necessary to take a drink in X number of days, weeks, months, years, or whatever. You can hardly hear that over and over and over and not begin to believe there's some power working within this thing. 
The instant the newcomer begins to believe that, that opens the mind. And they become willing to investigate. And upon investigation, we find that simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet. The 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. As we work and apply those steps in our lives, we undergo a personality change sufficient to recover from alcoholism. And we find the power greater than human power. When that happens to us, we then have become older members of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now we can go back to the left-hand side of the sheet. And we can help support the next newcomer, help them work their program, so they can have a spiritual experience also. The book plainly states you cannot give something away that you haven't got. Now, somewhere down the line, when they quit working the program out of the book, then in self-defense, they started measuring success by how long have you been sober, rather than by the quality of that sobriety. In the beginning, everybody was expected to work the program, have a spiritual experience. If they didn't want to do that, they were told, you might as well leave here because we can't help you if you don't do that. So older membership was based on quality of sobriety rather than quantity of sobriety. Now today you see all kinds of people in AA. You see somebody that's been in here maybe six months. They got a good sponsor. They got immediately into the program. They've worked the steps. They've had a spiritual awakening. They're always laughing, cutting up, having fun, always helping AA and doing what they can for other alcoholics. They are a delight to behold, and you just love to be around them. I've only been sober six months. You've got others that's been in here six, eight, ten years. Treated it like a cafeteria. <laughs> Took some, but left what they didn't want. Now, they're better than they used to be. But you never know what kind of shape they're going to be in when you run into them. One day they're up. The next day they're down. They're kind of like a yo-yo going back and forth. Then you see some people that's been in here 15, 16, 18, 20 years. Never worked a step. Damn proud of it. <laughs> and they're the ones that say, by God, if you want what we've got, and you're willing to go to any damn lengths to get it. You know, some of those guys feel so bad you'd like to buy them a drink. You know they would feel better with a drink, see. So we're not talking about quantity of sobriety here. We're talking about quality of sobriety. And only those that have had the spiritual experience can help another have a spiritual experience. You simply can't give away something you don't have. I see Bill running this all through his mind. And he probably says to himself, they're not going to like this idea of a spiritual experience any more than I did. Do you remember he had an aversion to these things? He and Abby argued about this for a long time. And I think Bill says, I need to tell them just exactly what's going to happen to them if they don't have this spiritual experience. And he writes another chapter, and he called it More About Alcoholism. And in this chapter, he talks about one thing and one thing only. He talks about the insanity of alcoholism. Alcoholism. 